all your relatives and friends are in the heavenly planets with us, but because a kshatriya makes his living by killing, therefore he has to get the results of this killing by seeing hell. And because you're a pious person and your uh, pious karma is infinitely more than your impious karma, then you get the results of your impious actions first. And then you get all this enjoyment without end in the heavenly planets because your pious activities were so tremendous. So then Yudhisthira gets into this discussion with Yamaraj. He's asking, well, what's going on here? Why is this like this? What kind of system is this? I don't understand. And, and uh, uh, then Dharmaraj explains that the, the, uh, just like the modes of material nature are divided into three, so the, all the actions of men are of three kinds. Similarly, the karmic reactions to those actions are divided into three separate kinds. And depending on the bulk of a person's karmic reactions, uh, the order in which they get those reactions is different. Whatever reactions are the least, they experience first. So in other words, if the bulk of a person's uh, actions in this life are impious or sinful, and just a tiny amount of, of pious action, then they go to heaven first. But after heaven, they fall down into hell for a long, long time. And the reverse is also true, that if a person's actions in this world are predominantly pious, but they have a little bit of impious reactions, then they have to experience hell for a short time, and then they go to the heavenly situation for a long, long time. Huh? Of course, all this is, applies to actions under the law of karma, which means material actions. And since the Mahabharata is on the platform of karma kanda, therefore it expresses or explains the uh, reactions in terms of their material uh, meanings. Uh, this does not apply to the devotee whose actions are completely transcendental. That's, that's a different part of the Vedas. Uh, those truths are explained in Bhagavad Gita, like in the third chapter where Krishna says, a uh, man whose actions are all done in devotional service, his work merges completely into transcendence. So transcendence is not involved with the material world at all, and there's no material reaction to transcendental activities. Uh, unless, of course, you make a mistake and do something material by accident. Uh, but even then, if it's by, really by accident, uh, Krishna says that you're excused from that and uh, you don't have to get the material reaction to that. You can still go to the spiritual world if you uh, allow yourself to be purified. So Krishna purifies his devotees while they're in the material world. And then when they go to the spiritual world, they don't have to go through the heavenly planets or hellish planets or any of that. That's the fourth kinds of action. The fourth kind of action is transcendental. It has no material reaction because it's not performed under the law of karma. It's eternal. And how is it eternal? Well, we have nine processes of devotional service hearing, chanting, remembering, worshipping, and so on. There's five more, but there are nine total given by Prahlad Maharaj in his famous verse, Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Vadasevanam, etc. So those nine kinds of activities are eternal because we're doing them here in the material world in our developmental stage of uh, spiritual consciousness 
and we're also performing the same activities in the spiritual world after liberation. We're still chanting Krishna's name, we're still uh, worshiping his lotus feet, we're still offering things, we're still thinking and remembering him, we're still hearing his uh, name and his pastimes and so many other things. All these items of devotional service that we perform in this material world are eternal because they're the same things that we're going to be doing in the spiritual world. Therefore, those activities do not have any material reaction. They only have a spiritual result. And that is that we get to transfer our existence to the spiritual world where our uh, existence is eternal and unconditional. Therefore, everyone should perform devotional service activities as far as possible while in the present body. And then in the next body will be in our spiritual existence, our spiritual identity, and there won't be any question of having to accept material reactions. That's the power of devotional service. That it actually takes us out of the range of the power of the law of karma. And even though we're still in the material world, our bodies become spiritualized. And we're actually under the control of the spiritual energy while in the material body. But this is the extraordinary power of devotional service. And that's why we recommend that everybody engage in beginning with karma yoga and then with the pious credits earned by karma yoga you can gain transcendental knowledge which is discussed in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita and then you can approach pure devotional service which is discussed in the fifth and sixth chapter and, and on after that. Uh, so this is a process, a gradual process of purification that involves the material body and the senses but because we're engaging the material body and senses in a spiritual process they become spiritualized huh? because actually they're nothing but spiritual energy <laughs> so this is the, the wonder and the power of devotional service and this is why everybody should be engaged in chanting the holy name and so forth so are there any more burning questions? Yes. <clears throat> I have a question. Ah, Florian has a question. Yeah, just speak, a speak up there, young fellow. A simple question. Uh, are, are there any descriptions of the pastimes of Lord Jagannath in the spiritual world? Dwarka Lila. Dwarka Lila? Yeah. Lord Jagannath is Krishna in Dwarka. So all of, all of the Dwarka Lila is actually about Lord Jagannath. But Lord Jagannath, his specific mood is that he's Krishna in Dwarka in separation from Vrindavan. That's his specific mood. Uh, just like there's this wonderful pastime narrated in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita. When uh, Gopakumar comes to Dwarka, you know, the, the guards and everybody say, oh, you're Gopa Kumar, we've been expecting you, come in. So they bring him into the palace and uh, he comes into the assembly hall of the Yadu dynasty and there's, there's Krishna surrounded by all of his great devotees, the Pandavas are there and uh, Vishta Dhyumna and all his sons and uh, all the great kings, you know, the uh, all the great Yadu dynasty kings are there, and oh, it's just a wonderful scene. And Narada Muni and all the sages are there giving advice and so on. And it's this amazing scene, like right, right out of Mahabharata or something. And so uh, Gopakumar is escorted in, and then and Krishna, when he sees Gopakumar dressed in Vrindavan mm -hmm. uh, clothing, he says, "Oh, come, come on, come on up here, you know." And uh, Gopa Kumar, I mean, he's still kind of freaked out because he was just in the Vaikuntha planets. Mm -hmm. And in Vaikuntha, you know, everything's very formal and very regulated and everything like this. Mm -hmm. So Krishna, went, you know, he's like paying his obeisances at the throne and, you know, being very humble. You know. 
But Krishna, he gets up and he comes down from his throne and he embraces Gopakumar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he says in, in a trembling voice, can I see your flute? And Gopakumar goes, sure. And he gives Krishna his flute. You know, as a cowherd boy, he's always carrying the flute. Mm -hmm. So Krishna takes the flute and he's like, looking at it, you know, and he, and he goes into this really, really like far away mood, you know, mm -hmm. and and then Krishna says, okay, um, the assembly is adjourned, Every, everybody go, go home, um, see you later, and he just kind of wanders off glassy-eyed, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Everybody's going, oh, what's going on? 